When I say begin, open your test booklet to page six. Begin. Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. The SAT, the Scholastic Assessment Test, usually called the Scholastic Aptitude Test, is a rite of passage for most all American high school students, but it wasn't always this way. For most of our nation's history, the SAT simply didn't exist. A provocative new book by the author Nicholas Lemon looks at the history, consequences, and future of the SAT. It's called The Big Test the secret history of the American meritocracy. In it, Lemon argues that the SAT has transformed the class structure in the United States for the worse. Lemon is joined on Think Tank by Thomas Kane, professor of public policy at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and author of The Price of Admission, Rethinking How Americans Pay for College, and Nina Shakrai Reese, the Senior Education Policy Analyst at the Heritage Foundation. The topic before the House, do tests pass? This week on Think Tank. Of all the factors that college admissions committees consider for acceptance, perhaps none is more important than an applicant's SAT score. This is almost precisely as the test's founders would have had it. The Educational Testing Service was founded in 1948 to administer the SAT to prospective college students. The idea behind the test was to enable elite colleges to select the most intellectually promising students from around the country on merit. The SAT's founders believed that this would establish what they called a natural aristocracy that would rise to prominence in the United States. It would replace a college admissions procedure that typically relied on a traditional class system determined by wealth, status, and prospects. Did the founders of the SAT succeed? Is that the good news or the bad news? Has it become, as Nicholas Lemon puts it, the all-powerful bringer of individual destiny in the United States? To answer these and other questions, we turn to our expert panel. Lady, gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, let's go around the room quickly. Uh, the first question is, is the SAT a good test? In pure testing terms, in techie testing terms, yes, it's a very good test. It's a well-made test with, with a, in the patois of testing. It has very high reliability and decent validity. But the question about the, a test, a test is a tool. That's like saying this set we're sitting on was built by the following hammer. If the hammer is a good hammer, does that mean this set is a good set? Not necessarily. I don't have a quarrel with the SAT as a test. The real question is, what's it used for? What effect does it have on the society? I, I do question its use as a tool to structure the society. What, what do you think of the set? What, of the set, the set's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Nina, uh, what do you think of the SAT? Oh, I think it's a great test. And the reason why so many colleges and universities are using it for admissions goes to show that it does predict fairly well how well a student is going to do academically in that school. Uh, and also at, at a time when not very many states require a criterion reference uh, high school exit exam. I think it's more important than ever before to have a test in place so that our colleges and institutions of higher learning can determine um, how to pick and choose the a students. As a baseline, sort of. Yes. Tom. I think the SAT is good at what it was designed to do, and that is to provide some criterion for, decide, for uh, differentiating among high school students who've attended a wide range of different types of high schools with varying curricula. But there are three reasons why it tends to be overused or overweighted. One, because it is so much easier to read, that e easier to process than carefully reading the file. Two, that it provides some 
uh, indicator that colleges can crow about. Like it's hard for a college to crow about all those wonderful essays that they got, but it's much easier for colleges to crow about the mean SAT scores of the students they admitted. And the third reason why it's overused and probably the most difficult to dislodge is that it helps admissions officers with minimizing the main thing that they get in trouble with faculty over, and that is it minimizes the chances that somebody is going to arrive on campus and completely fall on their face. It also increases the chances that they deny somebody who would have done well on campus, but faculty don't care about the second type of error. They care about the first type of error, and the SAT helps minimize that. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Um, Nick, uh, all the reviewers of your book say that the history part of it is terrific, and it is a fascinating story. Why don't you sort of briefly march us through uh, the history of testing in America and how we got to this place, and then we will try to talk about whether it's a good place or a bad place and what we might do with it. The first mass IQ test was the Army Alpha given in 1918 to all First World War recruits. One of the people who wrote and administered the test was Carl Brigham, a young psychologist at Princeton. And Brigham then went on to do two things in the early 20s. One is write the SAT, and the other is write a truly horrifying eugenicist tract, which to his great credit he later renounced. The SAT was an adopted Army Alpha IQ test made a little kind of harder and more literary to be used in college admission. In 1933, uh, James Bryant Conant was made president of Harvard. He, he took over a Harvard that was filled with what we would call loosely preppies, people who had gone to boarding schools, inherited wealth, everything was sort of set out for them, for them as Conant saw it. And he wanted to replace them with super brainy people selected from all backgrounds from all over the country. Conant had a young assistant named Henry Chauncey, who's now 94 years old and very hale and hearty, um, and is source for much of the book. Uh, he called in Chauncey and said, how do I find this new kind of student for Harvard? And Chauncey went out and looked and said, there is this man, Brigham, who has a test called the SAT. You should use that to select these kids. As Chauncey tells the story, Conant said, one thing I need to know, is it a test of pure intelligence, pure mental ability? I don't want an achievement test. I don't want to know how good their school was, how much they studied. I just want to know the brain power. And, you know, Chauncey assured him that that was the case, and uh, Conan adapted it. And then starting from there, it just, Conan was a very powerful man, and he was well positioned to spread the use of the test. So it just spread and spread and spread from being something to pick 10 scholarships a, uh, for Harvard a year to, you know, a general scholarship test for all Ivy League schools to the general admission test for all Ivy League schools to the current system where over two million kids a year take it. One of the predicates behind um, Conan's theory of testing is that going to Harvard is a good thing. Uh, and it is carried on to this very moment, the I Harvard seen broadly, uh, metaphorically, the Ivy League, uh, Stanford, the, the, the great schools, that this gives people a great advantage. Uh, I am not a big admirer of, of the Ivy League schools uh, necessarily. I think some of the state universities in, in, in this country stack up very, very well. Nina, is this part of the, the great hustle of, of Ivy, League, Ivy League academia? Um, well, I, I have to admit that, I, that, that the key flaw that I found in your theory is that unless you uh, went to a school like Harvard, you would somehow be relegated to the middle class and be stuck there for the rest of your life. Um, I, I don't think I say that in the well, book, by sort the way. Um, it comes out that way in, in, I would like in to, some well, place, especially I'll, I'll if you read the afterward. Um, I you personally say especially if you read the afterword? Yes, of the book. Um, I mean, I think the book is a very fine book, historically speaking. I learned things that I didn't know before about the SAT test and ETS, but at the end, it sort of weaves it into this theory that you have, which I don't agree with. Um, I think a lot of students are going to a lot of state 
uh, universities, community colleges, some of them, if they're doing well in those settings, can move on to schools like Harvard. But the real determinant of going into schools like Harvard is how much money you have. And as these schools become more and more expensive, it's going to be more difficult for a lot of qualified individuals who are doing well academically to enter these uh, schools of higher education. And to be honest with you, I think the big dilemma right now in education, in my view, is not so much with students who are not doing well enough on the SAT to go to Harvard, but with those kids in high school who, don't, who never even finish high school, drop out, or finish school and not, are not interested in even entering uh, college because of the high costs or because um, the schools are not reaching out, out to them enough. So you think the SATs now ha have become uh, a, a, uh, a class deal that, that sets up a privileged class in America. Definitely. Now let me let me and, explain and, and, more. And, and, and more. it's not a, a based on, on, it's not a merit-based class. But there, there's a perception out there in the world that the college admissions moment and the SAT in particular is highly determinant of where you end up in life. Now there's a debate that you know Tom's an active participant in in the academy about how true that really is, but that's a widespread perception. What we're arguing about here is, I mean, I want an America that looks the way you are saying America and you are saying America looks right now, uh, an America where where you went to college just doesn't matter all that much. I fear that we're I fear that we're moving yeah. in that too much in the direction right. of it mattering let, let, tremendously. Let's cut to the chase. Uh, Nina said that it's a wonderful book, but she doesn't agree with what you want to do. Why don't you tell us in your own words, before we all jump on you, okay. what you want to do? <laughs> what I would like to do, I, I do think we need some kind of national yardstick, some, some test, some big test that is given to all high school students. It, I would it, like it, it created and administered by the federal government. I'd rather have it done by them than by ETS because it's a okay. private, private nonprofits are the most unaccountable institutions okay. in America. You know, they're less accountable than corporations. Self-perpetuating board, you know the drill. Uh, I would like to see a national school-leaving achievement test, the kind that was just endorsed for by state by state. I'd just like to see it be national, so I don't think we disagree that much, um, based on national curriculum standards. I think that would be a much better system, partly because it creates a whole different set of incentives. The SAT creates incentives uh, for, does not incentivize schools to improve their general quality, and it does not incentivize students to study hard in school. A uh, national achievement test that would be similar to the New York Regents uh, put pressure on, they make it possible to measure how good a school is, make them suffer the consequence if they're not teaching, and they, they make the kid want to study. The final point of, of your thesis is we should take these tests but then disregard them. No. My final point is I don't, the, the system was set up by people who wanted to make higher education America's personnel office. The idea was, you know, opportunity in an open contest for the rewards in America is a good thing, but that race should be pre, pretty much over by age 21 or 22. You know, you should have everybody firmly tracked and slotted by that age. What I would say is, I like the idea of a race for opportunity, but I'd like it to be less dependent on the college credential um, and more dependent on what you actually do, how but, you but perform aren't, aren't, out there, there aren't in the world. Aren't you being a little disingenuous? I mean, a, as I understood it, y y you are basically coming out for uh, for preference by by class and race. Right now, affirmative action, thumbs up, thumbs down, I'm thumbs up. But I don't believe and, that... And, it, and affirmative action in the sense of preference. I mean, yeah. so we're not using yes, those funny yes, words yes, again. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Right, and okay. I can make the case if you want me not, to. <laughs> but the, the larger, not yet, not now. The yeah, larger vision show. of the book is really not, you know, that I'm an affirmative action Mooney who wants to create a kind of, you know, racial gerrymandering regime through schools. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, w Tom, how do you come out on, on this? I mean, he, here, Nick is in favor of... Uh, National tests, uh, s uh, both assessment and, and aptitude. Uh, I'm I'm not for national aptitude no, okay. tests. I would he, like he, to phase okay. that he, out. He is phase in federally all, all <coughs> federally designed system. national test based on a federally designed national curriculum and for preference for uh, admission into good schools. 
what do you think? I, I'm saving you for last year, yeah. really. <laughs> I think, as I mentioned before, even though we draw, there is an important distinction, semantic distinction between assessment and aptitude tests. In practice, the scores are very correlated. So, you know, in the world, you know, afterwards, admissions decisions based on an aptitude test like we have now versus an achievement test, I'm not sure would make that much of a difference in terms of the relationship between, you know, parents' income and where a kid goes to school. Although I agree with Nick that the symbolism is better. I'd rather have kids working hard in high school thinking that they're trying to maximize you know, their score on some you know, test rather than trying to game the SAT test. So I'd rather have them focusing on their coursework. Ironically though, I think it, that it's probably unrealistic to expect that those test scores would become less important. The same forces that have made them become more important are still out there and are still heavily at work. And that is, again, parents certainly perceive that going to a more elite school sure. is related. You know, it's not the only thing that matters. Certainly there's a wide distribution of outcomes for kids who attend any kind of college, but it's a way of trying to hedge your bet of, you know, it's the one thing you can control where your kid goes to college. And I think parents are going to continue to try to push. Uh, and the more elite schools are going to continue to get an increasing share of the applications from the highest test score kids and as a result will become more and more uh, selective. Okay. Nina, th there used to be those games, what's wrong with this picture, you know, what, <laughs> well, what's wrong with I, this picture? I, hypothetically, I think having a national test of sorts that measures students against the high bars is an attractive thing to have, but in practice, the federal government so far hasn't been able to come up with any kind of national standards, history standards, name is one example that has really uh, set the bar high enough for anyone to be able to take it seriously. So uh, I, don't, I don't like that notion at all. I like the ETS designing the SAT test uh, a ETS lot. ETS is the Educational, uh, Educational Testing, Testing Service, Service who administers the SAT right. and designs it, right? Uh, because it is a privately administered test and because then universities use it for admissions and in fact when the, when the whole debate on national testing was, uh, was underway in Washington, one of the things that my organization um, was considering um, to sponsor was the Heritage, uh, Foundation. The Heritage Foundation, yes. Uh, was um, to get groups like the Educational Testing Service and Sylvan Learning Center to come up with a range of private tests so that parents of, who have fourth graders and eighth graders could then purchase those and administer them on um, their students to see if their students are actually learning or whether the report card they're bringing home from school is somehow um, showing how well they're performing next to their next door um, neighbor. Um, so I guess I agree with you to some extent that even if you had a criterion reference, reference high school exit exam, you're probably going to see uh, the same discrepancies and the same number of uh, low income Hispanic and black kids not performing as well as um, they should. And this is again a problem in our K through 12 system, which we're not addressing we're, head on. Speaking of, of the differential scores of blacks and Latinos and whites, where do you, I don't want to get into it in depth, but where do you all come out on the murray hernstein bell curve argument? Simple little question. Well, actually, it's related to an issue that came up earlier. Are IQ scores related to earnings? There, the question is without a doubt, yes. And is there some evidence that there's some, maybe some genetic base the answer is probably yes. But even if the answers to those two are yes, I'm not sure that, the, that we're headed towards a society that's rigidly structured based on IQ, and that is kids with the same IQ have a wide range of outcomes. So even though average incomes rise with IQ, there's still a wide range of outcomes, and, and I don't see that going away. Um. I, to be honest, I don't know. Um, one of the studies we're conducting again at the Heritage Neither Foundation I, yeah, right. <laughs> is uh, looking at uh, high achieving inner city schools with uh, at least 75% minority students that are performing 
above the 75th percentile on the, on the state test. And we're noticing we found at least 25 of them around the nation. Um, and the, the key thing they have in common is the fact that they set the bar very high early on. They rely on research-based, replicable, reliable research early on to teach reading and math and what have you. They have devoted principals, devoted teachers. So unless, in my view, you, you could, um, or in my view, you can replicate the success of these schools easily if you roll up your sleeves and set out to do so. And until that's done, I, I'm reluctant to buy into the Murray um, notion that um, blacks and Hispanics cannot achieve. I, I agree. I mean, I, I think Nina's, you know, very forcefully disagreed with the bell curve as I read it, which is in the tradition of Jensen's famous article arguing that all these interventions in schools are completely worthless because you're going to run up against you know, racial differences in intelligence. I just don't believe that. And, and it, it's, it's, it's a very destructive argument because it leads exactly away from the things that work, such as Nina was describing. Even um, if you don't improve somebody's IQ score, if you improve their ability to, you know, write or their ability to express themselves, they're going to do all right. We are going through, we have to wrap up soon, but let me, let me just try to put some context in this thing. We are going through now uh, um, a phase where education in all the polls has become the number one political issue in America. Uh, all of a sudden, something that was quite controversial, which is the so-called standards movement, really originated, I believe, by Al Shanker of the American Federation of Teachers, uh, who was a a brilliant and a great American by, by my lights, and, and his, his thought was that the school system is so crazy quilt that you had to have standards and to have tests. I think everybody here agrees with that. And the third um, leg of Shanker's triangle was stakes or consequences. Now, everyone here is for standards. Everyone here is for tests. Where do you stand on consequences? Can you have a standard system without consequences? Well, I think it's important to ask consequences for whom. Right. If it's consequences... Consequences for the student who does not uh, do well on the test. It I am less comfortable with, cons with high stakes consequences for individuals but you they know, are students. high stakes. They're getting into college. Right. I mean, you're right. acknowledging right. that. Right, right, right. But say, but if, but the even higher stakes of do you graduate from high school, period, um, uh, I'd be less comfortable with. I would be more comfortable, though, with consequences for school principals. There's consequences for and school teachers. superintendents. Or maybe even teachers, although there, there's an awful lot of bouncing around in student performance but, that happens but, from but year to year. I, I mean... The answer to my question, should there be consequences for students who don't do well on tests, is yes or no? In some circumstances, with respect to going to college, probably yes. With respect to graduating from high school, I'm not so sure. Your view on consequences? I think you need carrots and sticks to make the system work. And I agree that you need to have consequences, not just for the students, but also the teachers and the principals. Um, but these consequences need to kick in early on in life. You can't wait until high school to determine if a student is going to go to college based on a, a test. I'm for consequences, but let me say that the social promotion thing is a bit of a sort of trendy issue right now. The studies on it that I've read show that it doesn't actually work. In other words, if you hold the kid back, the, the, those kids tend to fall further behind not to be helped by the second year and third grade. I'd come down if, on a yes or no on yes, but I also strongly agree with Tom that one big purpose of these tests is to hold the school accountable and the teachers and the principal and the administrators. That's very, very, very important, as well as holding the students accountable. That's what Bush has done in Texas, and I think it's terrific. I, I, um, and I'm also for abolishing tenure for all these people. Um, <laughs> you know, make them stand or fall on whether they're actually teaching kids in school, because kids only get one childhood, you know, and if, if the administrators screw it up, they don't have a second chance. I like that. Um, okay. Thank you, Tom Kane, Nick Lemon, and Nita Shokrei Reese. And thank you. We encourage feedback from our viewers via email. It's very important to us. We read it all, and I answer many of them personally. 
Uh, soon we will be reading the best of them on the air. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content. Stop.